Welcome to episode 77 of the Hoops Fix podcast with me, your host, Sam Nita, full-time British basketball advocate. And we've got another coaching guest on the show this week, none other than Neil Hopkins. Uh, as you'll hear, kind of like... He said it quite nicely. Our stories are kind of running parallel where I dug up an old email from, from 10 years ago when he first started out talking about some of his aspirations for the first academy he was at, Runshaw, um, about making it a place where players can kind of go and then go on to uh, the States afterwards. And actually, that's exactly what he's uh, gone on to do. He's obviously now the, the head coach and sort of overseer, uh, director of operations, whatever you want to call call it, um, uh, of Myersco, one of the most successful academy programs. You know, only been around since 2012, but the success they've had in that time, uh, not only uh, winning an EABL title and, and obviously multiple um, sort of Final Four, Elite Eight appearances um, in the EABL, competing in National League uh, Division Two, uh, working their way up, uh, and also... Last season, actually competing in European competition, the EYBL, which is the European Youth Basketball League, uh, and winning a regular season title. So he's had a whole uh, massive host of success, um, and it's been uh, yeah really inspiring to watch. Actually, uh, we, you know we spoke about a lot of things, uh, focused on the academy stuff, building academies, the state of the academy leagues, uh, the the role of, of social media. Actually, one of the things I said in the recording uh, was that I think Myersco has probably got number one uh, sort of social digital pr- uh, presence. You know, but there's a few others that are up there. But like I can yeah categorically say 100% uh, having actually thought about it, had a quick look. Uh, yeah, like easily the the sort of the biggest, the best. Uh, presence on social media and digital platforms and kind of we spoke about that and the role that it has uh with with recruiting players and sort of uh to what is essentially um he said it not me but a farm in the middle of, of Preston like you know Myersco is out in the sticks it's in the middle of nowhere and it's kind of become this uh, junior basketball powerhouse so yeah really enjoyed the conversation and it's one of the one of the ones where we were strapped by time he had to go and teach uh, so we had to finish uh, a lot earlier than I would have liked to so I think I'm going to get him on uh, for a part two uh, at some point down the line because we touched upon a load of stuff but really didn't go into loads of other stuff I wanted to but it was super enjoyable and I hope well I'm sure that you will find it as enlightening and enjoyable as I did before we get into the show as always a quick mention for our Patreon account p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash h-o-o-p-s-f-i-x there you can sign up to give us a monthly or annual contribution of as much or as little as you'd like to help us do the work that we're doing please uh, consider get, uh, making that contribution it goes a long way in helping us do the work that we do and really uh, doesn't need to cost you more than uh, the price of a cup of coffee as always, if you're watching on YouTube, let me know in the comments below what you think about what Neil had to say, what you think about the academies and Academy League in general. Um, you can reach out to me on every single social media platform at HoopsFix, uh, or if you prefer a bit of private interaction, uh, hit me up directly on my email address, sam at hoopsfix.com. Anyway, that is enough from me. Here is this week's show uh, with me and Neil Hopkins. Neil, welcome to the show. Hi, Sam. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for the honour. No, no, no problem. It's like, I, you, like I said, I always say there's like a massive long list of people that I always want to speak to that I'm kind of slowly working through, um, but the list is never ending. And uh, like I, when we briefly spoke last night, I said I feel like there's some, some stuff going way back when we first spoke um, 10 years ago. And I actually found the first email you sent me uh, in 2010. Um, and you're actually on tour in the states, uh, visiting some big some schools and everything else. And one of the interesting things, let me let me just have a quick look at it here. I've got it. I've got it uh, in front of me. One of the things you said was, um, this was when you were at, at Runshaw Runshaw College Basketball yeah. Academy, and you said my aim is to turn the academy into a place guys can come to lead them to the states. Uh, and obviously, this trip is you know massively helping that. Um, now to look at in those 10 years kind of everything that's happened since then yeah. it's pretty inspiring to be honest to see those sort of those, those early seeds of kind of what you were what you were intending to do and kind of what now obviously you're at Myersco what that's turned into be so what a journey it's been um and I think that's like I guess when I I briefly looked at your CV before we start recording looking at all the things you've done uh and obviously, all your 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 focus there is on coaching. It's like you wanted yeah. to be a coach. It's quite clear looking at the qualifications you have, the sort of the the book, the the, the book smart stuff, the the paperwork stuff. Um, you you really focus on that. Like, where has that come from? Uh, why has that been uh, sort of a big focus of yours? I think no, number one, that nostalgia of uh, I think it was ten years ago. Yeah, and I actually think that we we. 
we almost I say you started before me, I think, in terms of like the journey, but I think it's almost been in parallel a little bit. So it's been it's been nice to see, obviously, you know, the growth for Hoops Fix and the involvement of Hoops Fix. We've always been a huge advocate of what you've been doing. So that's that's a really nice like place to start, I guess. And that was a, a really good trip as well. And I think at that point I was just taking every opportunity that I could to experience basketball at, you know, at any different level. I was really fortunate actually with that. It was a guy called Chris Donnelly in the Northwest who you know, flew me and another coach from the Northwest out to, to America. And we got to visit 10 or 12 different schools and you know, sit down with some super high-level coaches and stuff. So it was, you know, I mean, there's probably a story in a story somewhere. But yeah, just um, the academic side. And I guess the big thing for me is when, when I started coaching, and it's you know, before that 10 years, so maybe 12 years ago, even through my university years, I wanted to make sure that Number one, I was on the floor coach as much as possible and doing as much as I could. Um, you know, I obviously looked through my CV and there's quite a few things in there that are not included, you know, stuff in sports development and, you know, doing primary school stuff and, you know, all the, the little things that you'd expect a young coach to be doing. I think Mark Dunning says paying your dues. And uh, I think that was, you know, the remit back then. I think as well at that point, there wasn't the way I look at it now is there's an evolution in terms of the way in which people pay their dues. I think now it turns to a little bit more online. It's a little bit less face to face. And, you know, I don't think people, especially young coaches, you know, I think that they, they're able to project themselves in a way that I wasn't back then. So I thought to myself, um, it's actually the, the irony of it all was, was actually the money that wasn't in basketball was the kind of motivation for doing, you know, the academic stuff and upskilling as much as I possibly could. You know, I, I, at that point, when I when I spoke to you, then I think I just I was maybe just about to start with the Tigers uh, in the BBL, and um, you know I, I was getting dipping my feet in, but there was no money. There was like you know we're traveling from from my house to speak in Liverpool, which is 45 minutes, you know an hour, you know there and back, you know traveling driving the length and breadth for the country. There was no you know I didn't get paid for anything. It was just there to you know put the hours in and, and do my time. But on the flip side, I was thinking to myself. Well, if I want to have a house, if I want to have a car, if I want to have, you know, the, the luxuries and stuff or, you know, even the things that, you know, give you comfort, then I'm going to need to earn some money. And to do so, I, I probably need to upskill in different areas. So at that point, when I was at Runshaw, um, you know, I, I obviously had done my degree at that point and I started doing my PGCE and my teacher training and, you know, adding that. And obviously that supplemented my coaching, um, you know, and I think it all came hand in hand. I was always academically in terms of delivery academics you know and in terms of teaching which is you know what I've done now for 10 or so years um, I always looked at that as a way to enable me to coach basketball you know at the highest possible level um, obviously it's really difficult to establish a balance between full-time teaching and full-time coaching which is ultimately what I'm doing alongside you know coaching at a BBL level or you know whatever running your own program then traveling the length and breadth of the country to you know to go to BBL games um, you know so it was for me, it was more about security. It was more about, you know, not putting all my eggs in the basketball uh, basket, um, so to speak, and, you know, making sure that I had something, or not so much to fall back on, but something to run alongside my coaching to make sure that it was sustainable. And also, I think, from a, especially from a younger age, and you see through my CV, it's like, you know, I've added qualifications there and there and there and there and stuff. But I, I had the, the experience that we had with the Mersey Tigers, for instance, I wasn't getting paid, but I saw the effect that money could have on, you know, the stability of players, coaching staff and stuff. And I didn't really want to be, you know, fall into that trap. Um, you know, I, I didn't want to, at that point, that was all I knew. That was my experience of British basketball at the highest level was the Mersey Tigers and, you know, guys not getting paid. Um, you know, and I, um, at that point, I was like, well, if I'm going to commit to this, I need to make sure that I have a balance. I need to make sure that, you know, I look after what I want, you know, away from the court. And that's why I started doing, you know, the, the academic side and, you know, trying to push that, you know, as much as possible. Always felt hand in hand with the coaching. But, you know, that was why I did it. I feel like in retrospect for myself, that probably would have been a better journey for, for me in the sense of looking at something where I can I can balance it because I've done the complete opposite where I have zero tolerance for almost doing anything that I don't want to do uh, just to give myself the financial stability because I don't want to do anything for money. But then, yeah, I'm now in a situation where it's like, I, as obviously I, I get older, I'm looking at things, it's like, okay, well, how can I get that financial stability whilst doing the things that I love? Um, and yeah, I'm still still trying to trying to work that out. But I think 
actually when I when I look at things now, whereas I've always looked at who's fixes with a with a purity of like I don't like almost like it would ruin it if I tried to make money from it because it's kind of like what I love and I don't want to put ads on stuff and I don't want to, you know, do paid branded content on social media or whatever. Actually, the best thing I can do for Hoops Fix is to make it profitable to, and for it to make money because it means I'm going to do it for so much longer and I'm going to be able to put more resources, more time, more energy into it to, to, to ensure that it has the longevity. Um, and it's taken me this long to sort of start really realizing that and that's become a, a much more focus. So it's really interesting to kind of... But that's it, that's that's one of the biggest issues with British basketball, you know, is the it's the the freebie culture, you know, and and ultimately, you know, people's livelihoods depend on it. And if you want to professionalize the sport and make it, you know, more uh, appealing for people to have a career within it, then you have to monetize it. And you know, I I I I, um, I think we're especially yourself, you know, but everyone is uh, akin to giving up their free time and being a volunteer and almost like a servant to the game. But also, like, how do we push it forwards if we don't tr turn it into something that's professional that can support you? Because ultimately, you're just going to lose a person like you, a person like me or whoever to another industry. And then, you know, the sport just doesn't grow. So until it is professionalized in that sense, from a from a monetary kind, kind of way, we're not going to move forward. You know, I've had that conversation with a number of people um, you know, it's but I think there's all there's also because of the culture, it's it's also difficult to ask people for money, and you do feel like almost um, you know you feel you'd like you're taking the sport for granted, for instance. But how do we how do we move forward? You know, you, you, like, for instance, if you go into to rugby or something like that, and you see you seek consultancy in, in rugby for you know coaching, it's a hundred pound plus an hour. You know, if I wanted to get a mentor from a from a from a rugby standpoint, and I actually put I, I you know I have a you know, uh, an indirect and kind of direct relationship with Brian Ashton, um, you know, rugby union legend. And, and I asked him for some mentorship and, you know, straight away it's like, well, yeah, you know, we'll, I'll send you the invoice over. I'm like, okay, right. But he's not moving off that, you know, whereas within basketball, it's, it's quite easy to reach out to someone and say, you know, help me out. And yeah, they'll do that. But that's, that in a way is like testament to the sport, but also it does affect the professionalism, you know, of, of the sport and able, you know, your ability to, to do it solely as your your only thing. So yeah, you know, I I, say, I completely empathise with you there, but it is the culture that we need to shift. I think. Yeah, I, I yeah, a hundred percent. There is um, there's something Dave Forrester kind of said on on the podcast, which a term that I really like, which he talks about, is sort of growing the basketball economy, and I think that is is something that I've really taken with me of, of just looking at things of like, okay, well, how can this be monetized, you know, and it's making. It's making people see the value in, you know, whether it's Division One basketball and, you know, sometimes people show up to a game. It's like, oh, I'll pay three pounds to go and watch a game. Like, you know, that's, that's crap. Like, and it's like, well, no, nah, actually, that's what supports the club and, and grows the game and allows the club to do more things and put on more sessions and, and sort of push things forward. Um, so, yeah, there is a massive, massive uh, weird culture around money and basketball in, in the UK that needs to change. Um, and, yeah, and hopefully, you know, I'll work work that out over the over the over the coming years uh well so just to jump around a little bit like um before the run short stuff like sort of growing up like what was your background with basketball like why basketball specifically it, it, it was really limited actually and uh yeah I, I think i did the the podcast for basketball england and I, you know i listened to that i talked about it yeah i talked about it a little bit but really like you know really and truthfully that basketball for me was you know, something that I came into really, really late. I was, I'm from Worcester. And at that point, um, there wasn't anything, you know, there really wasn't anything for me to get my teeth into. So actually it was, I think I actually started playing like 14, maybe 15, 16 at high school. Um, you know, from there, I was always like a, a sporty person anyway. So I played, you know, a lot of different sports, but I like really enjoyed basketball. And then from there, I moved to Worcester Sixth Form to their academy um, when the you know academy system just about kind of started, they were at that point the Worcester Wolves were in I think Division Two NBL Division Two, but there was no correlation or crossover between the academy and the you know the stuff that was happening at the university. And actually, it was like two different islands. So we we were kind of just you know up there in, in the sixth form, and they were down there in the university, and and that was really it. Like there was a, a you know a group of us um, that were at the academy at that point. We were coached by Rick Solverson. Um, you know, and we just really enjoyed basketball. We took it as far as we could. Um, at that point, there was no publicity or, you know, we didn't film games and stuff. And, you know, I'm not going back decades, but I mean, it probably is now. But, um, you know, it was it was more that we just really enjoyed it. And there was nothing more out of it than that, really. And from there, 
um, you know, I, I finished university. No, sorry, I finished uh, at, the, at the sixth form. And actually, whilst I was playing um, basketball there with the academy, we I was I was playing hockey as well, like field hockey. You know, my, my parents are that's their kind of sport. My brothers are, you know, a really good player, and I was probably naturally a lot better than, at that than I was at basketball. I enjoyed basketball more, so I was actually playing um, hockey at weekends at that point. So because there was no national league, there was there was literally nothing in Worcester that at that point that would ca- like captivate you into you know the no national league there was no junior national league there was an academy which you know was ad hoc you know like aoc kind of deal um you know we were pretty good at that point we were you know a good squad but that was it um there was a decent little fraternity of people within worcester that were playing it at that point as well but that that was that was basically it and then i i moved um I wanted to move away from Worcester, so I moved up to the University of Central Lancashire in Preston. And I, I went from one situation, there was no National League, to another situation, but there was no National League. So then it became, you know, Bucks basketball or Busa back then. And, you know, we again, we had like a really good team, um, did really well, but it was always like our own little bubble. And, you know, that was how it kind of happened. I think from a, from a coaching standpoint... Um, you know, I just, I just naturally, it was not, there was never, it was off my own back. Um, I just enjoyed the sport and, you know, as I didn't have the opportunity as a player. So, you know, coaching was something that I just kind of, you know, went into it. It's, it's like the irony of it all now is that, you know, I probably play and do a lot more, with, you know, with regards to playing basketball now, you know, than I did back then. But I've always seen it from a player. I, I just love playing sport. I enjoy playing sport. And it's it's nothing, you know, competitive and all that stuff. It's just nothing. It was never anything more than that because I didn't know it to be anything more than that. You know, that was that was it. You know, for me, that was the the kind of culture and stuff that I was within the sport in. Um, you know, you do your basketball camps and stuff. I used to do Millfield and you know all that kind of stuff. And that was it. Just just loved the sport. It was yeah. It was never it was never anything more than that. And I think that's something that's maybe lacking. I see these kids now. You know, there's like almost like. I almost had an innocent wonder, you know, I didn't see America or I didn't, I didn't even know about National League because there was nothing close to me. And, you know, my parents weren't basketball people, so they would facilitate and take me to practices and stuff like that. But ultimately, it was off my own back and, you know, it stuck. So, you know, I must have enjoyed it and I obviously still enjoy it. I think that's the key to it, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. Uh, it's funny, like, I, I, because kind of, I guess, doing doing hoops fix and stuff there is a there is clearly a, a focus on the elite end of the of the spectrum like you know a lot of the academies we cover it are the, are the better ones with the better players and a lot of the players that we cover obviously is, is focused on the, the kids that really have aspirations to be you know professionals and and represent the great Britain senior team and whatever else um but i always forget there's just a whole massive like uh i don't even know what you call it population of 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 players that just play because they enjoy it and just want to have fun and whatever else. And there's money there as well. We're going back to the whole economy thing. You know, they're, they're buying basketball sneakers and they're buying jerseys yeah. and, you know, they're buying gear to play in. Um, and I do think, yeah, there is there is such a focus on the... the it's almost like there's a, there's a focus on the elite and there's a focus on, on the grassroots in terms of the, the younger players, but actually just the recreational players, there yeah. is a whole load of stuff that could be done around that, which... Uh, which really isn't, uh, and like yeah, the stuff you're saying about kind of no national league club, that was the same. You know, growing up in Eastbourne, it was very much like nearest club was was Worthing, Brighton Bears. Like, so that was 45 minute drive. My dad wasn't going to take me there, um, so it was very much like this is I have to yeah. learn to play here, and that's what I'm going to do. Um, but yeah, and that's that's the case for so many players up and down the country that are sort of not near near the hubs. And that's the other thing that I think this interesting kind of obviously the stuff that you're doing, the areas that you're focused on. You know, like I've been to Myersco and boy, it's in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> you know, and, and, and like, and Runshaw, like looking at it again, it's kind of on the outskirts. I've, I've never been there, but um, it is in places where I guess historically don't have a, a basketball culture in that way. Like, you know, is that, is that by design? Has that been by design or has that been like, well, this is where I can get a job. And so, and I love basketball, so I can actually build something here. Well, I, I, the Preston area historically actually had a decent basketball culture, but it was all again. This was prior to, you know, there's there's um, I mean, for those that for another bit of nostalgia, there was a guy um, up here. Well, he's still up here now, called Dave Bridge, who used to run what is called the Dirty Mixtape. So as um, you know, um, Greg Tanner was doing all the stuff with Streetball.co.uk. Um, 
Dave Bridge was doing a lot of stuff in the same era within the Preston area. So there's a there's a fraternity of guys, you know, the generation definitely before me, you know, that that really, you know, had a lot going on with basketball. You know, for instance, like that, so Ben Eves came from Preston. Um, you know, at that point, like uh, even someone like Tom Sutton, you know, had a decent reputation within like the street ball scene. So actually, the fraternity within Bas- within Preston, there was uh, you know a, a, a park up here called Moore Park, which is like you know where they would. You know, this is where we'd always go go and play and stuff. And then they had all the beef with the Bradford guys. And like it was, you know, and I, I walked into that uh, when I moved up here, that was at the tail end of it. So actually the fraternity of basketball within the Preston area, historically, it's probably a bit underground, but it is there. Um, you know, then you span up to like the Barrow area and stuff. And obviously, you, you know, you have the, the hoop situation up there. And, you know, again, the, the fraternity before me and maybe the, even a little bit before that, the basketball culture was here. But I just don't think, Within this area, basketball just didn't move forward. So actually, the team that I picked up when I moved to um, to Runshaw was a team that had been coached by Chris Straker, um, who's now in, a, in the States. And um, he'd uh, taken, so Leyland, I don't know, the population is probably about 65 or something like that. You know, it's not a very big area, but out of that population, he'd managed to get like a decent little team together. And I, I picked up the pieces from kind of where he was. And, you know, that was a group that I think, one thing is that, the, you know, having moved from Worcester up here, like number one, like the people up here, you know, they, they battle, especially when it comes to sport, you know, they're super competitive and, you know, they want to win. And that always, that's a big help, um, you know. And I, and I think it wasn't necessarily about me putting in place an opportunity. It was just me carrying on the work and trying to bring basketball through, you know, from the last, you know, the, the dirty mixtape guys to the to the new era. And, um you know, that was kind of where I saw myself fit. And, you know, I had, like, especially with Runshaw, you, you're right, that we, you know, in, I mean, Runshaw is a little less isolated than Maesco, you know, but Runshaw, um, we, we just had a good group of kids. I had uh, Terry, Co- Terry Crosby's son, Leon Crosby. Terry Crosby, obviously the BBL legend. And, you know, Terry, uh, sorry, Leon at that point was at the Manchester Magic. And, you know, he was from Bolton. I had, like, the Bolton area, Wigan area, a few kids from there. And then we had this little group of guys from, from Leyland, uh, which is, you know, just a little town next to me. And we just did really well. And, uh, you know, off the back of that, I, I, I think we had some success in my first year. And then, you know, the, the recruitment kind of started a little bit. And we brought in, you know, the, I, I think as a clip of Matt Clark, you know, that we found out of Sefton, um, you know, dunking it on someone, which I sent over to you back in the day, and Matt Sheriff. And then we started to have a little bit of um, success in terms of placing them, and you know, I was, at that point, I was really focused on trying to help them move on to the next level. And you know, like even even people like Michael Griffiths, the one, you know, the kid that was uh, um, was well, not the kid, the, the man that was in uh, Love Island, came and played for us at Runshaw for a little bit. And um, yeah, there you go. There's uh, some trivia really? for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah so. If that's, I, I might need to Google him because I feel like there was someone in Love Island that I swear. It, familiar but I'll, I'll 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 search him but yeah that's funny yeah. You should, it's funny you should mention that that matt clark kick uh mark matt clark clip because i actually one of the things i did briefly this morning was 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 like let me dig up this this because i know you used to have a youtube account because i remember like being subscribed to it and seeing yeah. like highlights and games and stuff that you put up and this is this is the thing right is that like this is 2010 it's not even that long ago right it's, it's like yeah. it's, te- it's well it is it's 10 years ago but <laughs> but but like in my head i'm like 2010 is not like you know the flipping 80s or whatever um but back then, the thing like you, even at that point, were very focused on making sure all your games were taped. You know, yeah. having having highlights, doing mixtapes, which was still like you know, compared to the proliferation nowadays, where it's like every game is filmed. You know, mm. that if if it's not filmed with it with a video camera, there'll be people with phones, and, and and so like stuff is captured. There isn't stuff that's missed in the same way. Yeah. Um, but like, yeah, on the on the video side, like kind of. Why was that so important? Like, why did you? Why were you kind of, I guess, ahead of the curve in ensuring that, uh, you know, you had the game tape, you were doing the highlights, um, you were ensuring that sort of there was a web presence for, you know, Runshaw. Yeah. First and foremost, I like I can't look back on my own tape and see, you know, how uh, how I was at sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. You know, that's and and that for me is something that I always hold, you know, with you know, and in, in my mind because irrespective of whether these kids go to America or whatever, you know, they can look back and they can say, hey, you know, these are my highlights from the 2009-2010 season. They can watch back and they can have that, 
you know, they can feel like, yeah, look at that. That was great. I really enjoyed that. And it's a memory that you've put on a, the web, which isn't ever going to go. And that number one, that, that was it. That was like, you know, my reason was to, to make sure these guys could always remember. And it's funny now because, you know, these videos will pop up and then they'll tag me and, you know, we'll have a load of, you know, a load of talk. And I think, you know, that's, it was an investment, you know, more than anything. And you know how it is, like, especially back then, you know, it wasn't quite VHS, but it wasn't easy to do it all and to clip down. And, you know, the, the time that I've spent doing that kind of stuff and trying to, I think I sent you one, I, I remember sending you um uh, like a highlight package from the end of the season and I put some like um, really big operatic, operatic music on it I said can you have a look at this and you're like yeah yeah that's really good but uh, the music's a little bit intense you know what I think and I was like so from there I, rem- I, remind, I remind that uh, remind myself of that every time I put together a mixtape now so <laughs> I don't I don't go with the the, um, the the that kind of music anymore but to yeah number one to give them that you know that nostalgia and you know it's an investment and you know those times where we took them on tour and we went to places, and now they can look back at it. And they, might, some of them, are not involved with basketball in any, you know, any way. But they can always look back at it, and you know, that's that's great for me. And that's something that I only appreciated having been through the situation and not having anything to look back on. Really, you know, some university games and stuff. But you know, I'd have liked that. You know, I'd have, I'd have liked that from no, no matter what angle, just to say, oh, he, you know, look at look at me. You know, this is when I was 66 kilos or whatever, and you know, and could run up and down. But then. On the other side, obviously, it was, you know, a case of trying to build, you know, a catalogue that I could share and send and, you know, make sure that even if that, you know, I, I've always taken a really active approach in trying to push the, the footage out and, and send it to coaches and connect with coaches. And, you know, obviously, without footage, you're you're, you're struggling. And um, why if you if you can do it, why not do it? You know, and, and I think at that point in 2010 or whatever, it was something that was very important. Uh, it was important for me. It was important for the guys. And, you know, we pushed it. So, yeah. In turn, yeah. And I guess then it's just been a case of trying to go one up and one up and one up since that point. I think our production has kind of improved a little bit since then. But, you know, the the, the mantra is still the same. Well, that, that That is the thing. It's like when, you know, when I, well, you know, clearly like, especially in the last few years, Myers Co., you know, I would I would guess that it coincides with, with the hiring of, of, of Alan Gunn uh that like you know your outputs in terms of the brand the presence online you know is pretty much uh would i say i would say number one ish for academies between you and charmwood i would say uh but then everyone else is up in their game as well at the moment um and uh i i do feel like you know speaking to to players like that stuff is just so important now isn't it like it's like that's that's almost and it's and that's very much the same in, in in the states it's but but like that that sort of culture is coming over here where it's like, yeah, you know, of course players want to play for the best team and be playing at the highest levels and all that kind of stuff. But actually, they also want, you know, the the, the online presence, you know, the 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 recognition, the the online celebrity, if you want to call it that, the mixtapes, the graphics, the photos, all of that kind of stuff. Like, how have you seen that evolve over the years? How much has your strategy uh, at Myers Co changed? And, and sort of when did you realize that this, of course, like I've said, it was always a focus, but the the levels of, of kind of where you've taken it to uh, has evolved massively. Like kind of at what point has sort of that happened? And kind of, I'd be interested to hear your kind of thoughts on the progression of it and how kids perceive it. Yeah, I think initially when I started at Myers Co, obviously it was really about pushing the, you know, the brand out there. And I think ultimately, yeah, there's this element of, you know, um, showing, you know, the, the giving the kids their platform, for instance. But also, I think I've always I've said it in a, you know, a number of times. It's about the transparency of the program as well. Like, you know, we can't there's definitely things that you can build in, you know, perceptionally wise. You know, you can see it a certain way, for instance. But I think with the amount of content that we have out, like that is genuinely kind of how it looks and what we're doing, you know, especially at Myasco. Um, in the early years, when I first started there. Um, I, you know, this is, again, I'm sure a number of people have been in this situation where I needed content. So I need to buy a camera, you know, so I bought a camera. Well, this camera is not good enough. Can't get stills on the ball. So I need to upgrade the camera. And, you know, I did that, you know, then, um, oh, I need to do some videotapes. So I've got a GoPro. And at this point I was doing off my own back. Oh, I need to do some graphics. So, you know, I got Premiere Pro and started to work through the Adobe suite. So then I got good and efficient with the Adobe suite. 
Um, you know, so whenever I like I saw an evolution, maybe from America and it dripped fed into what I was seeing, right? Well, I need to upskill, I need to do it, I need to so it's almost I always joke about it. Like typically I'm, you know, absolutely I'm Jackie Moon of uh, of Northern basketball, you know. And so now this weekend we got all the, the Lynch trophy, we need to we need to run a live stream. So I need to teach myself how to use OBS. So, you know, and that's all I need to commentate, you know, whatever it is, like, you know, those are the things that I've always felt right. Let's let's just jump on it, let's just do it and from that we've just built i think a culture of like trying new stuff um you know bit like building it and ultimately the, the kids have gained a massive benefit from it alan Gunn, um he was involved with the lancashire spinners when i when i started over there um was a graduate of salford university and he was doing stuff with the spinners and at that point like you know obviously i built up a really good relationship with him and he could see what i was trying to do through my so this was actually maybe 2017, I think, that he's, that, you know, 2016, I started to build my relationship with him. He didn't do anything for my at that point. I was still doing all the content through WordPress, through YouTube, you know, Instagram. What was the little Vine, was it? The, the little three second one or whatever. So, you know, I was doing all the content, pushing the content at that point alongside everything else. Um, and then Alan, when I finished with the spinners, um, you know, in 2018, I think it was, maybe 17, I, I said to, to Alan, do you want to, you know, come across and, and help us out over at, at Myasco? And obviously he was, he loved what we were doing, you know, in terms of trying to promote the, the, the kids. And, you know, that was something that he, you know, felt, you know, was valuable. Obviously at that point then I think Myasco had started, you know, we'd started to have more success at the higher level with higher level kids. So it was good then, you know, you, you almost have some, say, take for instance, Eduardo Delcadia, who's now at UNLV. You know, you could see that these kids are going to progress through to, you know, a higher level. So actually, it's like it's great to build that relationship with them early. It's great to be able to project them early. And, you know, it's almost like the fruit of it all is starting to happen now. And I think that through building their profile online, through managing their expectation, you know, the, their expectation versus the reality versus the perception, we've been able to do that. Um, you know, and, and obviously, Alan kind of jumped at the opportunity to do it. So. Yeah, it's uh, for, from my standpoint, you know, in terms of the program, it's about, like I said before, the transparency. It's about, you know, showing that, I mean, this is all additional stuff that we do for them. I think that you've got to be, you know, of a certain ilk to do that. You know, you know that yourself, the late nights, early mornings, and, you know, you've got to be able to do it. But, but ultimately, I just want to give these kids a platform that they can look back on and, and use in their own way and you know I, I, this is our way I think now in this era to to be able to do that aside from the coaching now you have to you know you said it I think when um when I started this eight years nine years ago there was a, a remit of importance in terms of recruitment in terms of what the kids were looking for you know number one um, they're usually typically looking for like level of competition. I think that's still in there. Number two, you know, that's level of competition in terms of what you're playing at. Number two, um, who you coach, who you get coached by. Uh, number three, um, who you're going to be playing against within your practice, okay, which is, you know, obviously important. Number four, then it's like the merch, you know, what, what T-shirts am I going to get? Now, it's like, number one, you know, maybe it's level of competition, but uh, close to might be what is the social media you know what is the presence what is what are you going to do how how are you going to project me how are you going to get me to america how are you going to do this how are you going to do that that's a really tough thing to balance and a really tough thing to manage you know in our position now and that is something that i think has really evolved over the last seven or eight years it's uh you know and, and it for me that's where i'm mean, waffling on a little bit here now but the island, and I don't have talked to you about this before, we have the island mentality, you know, we're stuck on, the, stuck on the island and we don't really know basketball too much off the island. If we were on the continent, I don't think those thoughts would be the same. I don't think that the kids would be as, um, you know, unrealistic with some of their goals and aspirations because they would be exposed to basketball at a different level, um, you know, and, and that's something that as academies, um, you know, that if we are not sensible with the way in which we run our social media, we can um, we can engage kids, I guess, in the wrong way. Uh, we can almost force a sense of entitlement uh, and we can enable. And I think that's something that we need to be conscious about. So we've tried to do it all, you know, with diligence to, with regards to that. And we talk about that a lot, myself and Alan as well. Yeah, it's interesting you say that, like, 
the the levels thing i think is is something that uh across across the uk we're very much uh yeah not aware of uh that island mentality and 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 we have exactly the same conversations at hoops fix where it's like you know there are certain things that obviously obviously we try and focus on the positive stuff right and of course that means hyping it up to a level but at the same time it's like well you know if, if a player for example i'm trying to do it in a way that isn't throwing shade at anyone or whatever do you know what I mean? if, if a player averages 30 in, in, a, in under 18 conference or under 18 even under 18 premier like what does it really mean like what is the level of that competition does it mean that that player is a future pro like and you see it all the time on social media like <laughs> all the time you, you get comments from people kids being like this kid's going to the NBA, you know, a kid that's never represented the national team, never been close to the national team, but he's, you know, doing really well in school's competition or whatever. And it's just like, you know, realistically, we've had, what, seven players that have been UK developed that have gone to the NBA yeah. in the history. Like, it's just like, it's just not going to happen. The, the levels of how good, the level, the levels of, of how good the NBA is, how good the EuroLeague is, how, you know, yeah. like, there is just a lack of awareness of that. And yeah, the, 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 I was actually saying this to someone else recently as well. It's like, I even, and again, I'm trying not to throw shade here, but obviously I listen to a lot of the uh, the media that goes out around British basketball. Yeah. And even from a, from a media standpoint, and, I, and by the way, I'm not saying that I know everything because obviously I don't and I have a lot of my own education to do it and, and I'm aware that I my own basketball IQ is not the highest or whatever. But um, the media needs educating as well because if the media isn't educated, they do exactly the same thing where they're talking about certain players or certain games or, or certain competitions or whatever. And talking about it in a way where it's just like, what are you talking about? Like, and then unfortunately for a lot of people who maybe don't know any better, will listen to it and be like, yeah. Like, and then that becomes the narrative. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we need like more. We need more players. We need more former coaches that that sort of have played in Europe, competed in Europe, whatever. You know, seen the different levels to be able to come back uh, and and actually, you know, have podcasts, do the media side of things, come onto shows like this. Um, to, to give people that the awakening. One of the, one of the things I always say about the levels, I feel like I might say this on a podcast, but I know I say it to a lot of people. So I used to go to Adidas Euro Camp every day, every year, which of course was you know it's the international pre draft camp essentially, but it generally doesn't feature a lot of the first rounders because those guys are already locked, and so actually you know agents try and protect them, don't want them to play in games because they feel like it could hurt their stock if they're going to go first round anyway. So you get a lot of the the second round sort of on the verge of getting drafted um, players, and uh, and one year Evan Fournier played in it now. He obviously was he was a lock to go first round. He only ended up playing. I think he played one day or day and a half before his agent ended up shutting him down because he he was so much better than everyone. Yeah. Like it was ridiculous. And you're like, well, this guy's a first rounder. Every and he went he went mid to mid first round. I feel like he went between fifteen yeah. and twenty ish somewhere like that. Uh, all of these guys are on the verge of getting drafted. Or a few of them went second round. And he's so much better than him. And then you think, well, what is like? A lottery pick compared to you know Evan, <laughs> Evan Fournier, like, and and all this stuff, and, and it's only when you you get out, you get out and about, and you kind of you see the different levels, which again, exactly like you're saying, we're not exposed to, so we just we just don't know, and it's not until you put, you know, I think that's why, uh, you know, putting someone like Cameron against a Euroleague Junior Tournament competition, you can then see it. Obviously, yeah. you guys, you know, like going into Europe, it's the same sort of thing, like, and that's. I guess the next place to go is like obviously the European competition EYBL, which you've been in for the last two years now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. two yeah. years. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah, go on. Did you want to say something? Well, no, no. I, I was, I was just going to say that there's, you know, I think within the general basketball population, especially at a certain age group, and I find it with the two thousand and threes in particular. You know, there's a, there's an, there's an, all, they're always looking out, all, always looking out, to, and it's just like it's infuriating, you know, and and uh, you know that why being a master of what you're doing right now. You know, think about what's happening right now and master it. Like, I have these conversations with some of these kids within our program. You know, oh, can I go and play Division One? Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, you're not – if you were the top guard in our program, then, you know, number one, you, you might you might have an opportunity to be seen. But at the moment, you're a fifth guard within our program. You haven't mastered what we have right here. So let's think about that. And, you know, yeah, you're right. You know, you can have 30 points in a, you know, an, an under-18s conference game or, you know, whatever it may be. That's great. Enjoy it. But – that's what it has to be you know and it's always like you know one thing it's like this domino of like oh you know i've had 30 no and i'm entitled you know next one i'm entitled and and then we enable with the uh, social media oh yeah look at this and then we enable with you know some some of the wrong comments on maybe a you know a podcast or whatever and before you know it you know the kid is you know his head's like this he has a fall you know he doesn't do something so well and then he that's it he dropped off 
But isn't that the football culture as well, though? You know, that's what we do with our, our young footballers. And you know, that's, maybe it's just British. Maybe you know, that's it. We we get overexcited a bit early. But there you go. <laughs> how, how do you? Uh, you know, obviously at Myersco, you you got a lot of kids, right? How yeah. do you? How do you actually have those conversations? Because I I assume. I mean, may- maybe not, but I would assume the vast majority of them actually want to pursue basketball as a thing and they yeah. see basketball as their thing. It's not like, oh, I'm just at the college and I'm going to play for the basketball team, you know? Um, so, of course, you're going to have certain guys that are that are playing uh, playing in the first team, so so to speak, that are getting all the love, that are getting, getting the, the accolades, if you want to call it that, getting the love on social media and stuff. You know, I assume when, when you get a kid that maybe isn't playing so much that comes to you and says, I want to go to the States, you know that they're not anywhere close to the level of being of, of doing that. Like, how do you play out that conversation? Do you feel like honesty is the best policy? Do you have to be like really harsh, uh, or do you try and do it in a in a sort of gentle way? I'm not like I'm. You know, if they ask the the, the guys how to describe me, they describe me as a square. The thing, the the one fortunate thing that I have now is like the safety net of the staff that we have as well. Like, you know, it's it's a uh, the the message that can I can give is not just from me. You know, it's from the likes of Mike Bernard, you know, experienced former pro. Troy Cully obviously understands the game, you know, a, you know, GB coach. You know, then James Jones has come in, has been played in America, coached in Canada. And our, our new SS, we just hired an SNC coach uh, called Joe Gurley, who was a strength and conditioning coach at UAB. So, like, now we have a, a consortium of people that we can hit them from different angles. And I think for me, it's always like, yeah, you know, that I don't want to discourage a dream. I don't want to discourage you, you know, being ambitious. But let's be realistic and let's think about what we're doing right now. Let's, like I said before, let's master it right now. You know, are you the best player within the program right now? No, no, I'm not. Okay, well, if you have that level of self-awareness, let's work on that. That's part of it. You know, if you're, un- if you think, if you're coming to me and saying, I am the best player and you're not the best player, then that's very easy to solve because you just come and you come up right. We'll we'll play you against what we perceive as being, a, you know, a Division One player. You know, and, and we've obviously produced those over the last couple of years. So it's you've got those people available to you. So through um, a consortium of people that are experts, um, you know, and then also through we one fortunate thing we have is everyone within our program plays basketball for a different reason. You know, there was only one Amari Williams. There was only one Bradley Caboza. You know, their route and you know their their goals might be different. But their route might be, uh, I'm sorry, their goals might be the same, but their route might be completely, completely different. And, you know, actually, some of the guys that might make up what you'd classify as the numbers within our program, they understand the game from a fun point of view. They want to have fun with it, you know, and those are the guys that you obviously don't worry about from that standpoint. But there is definitely a middle tier that are, you know, that are always looking for the next thing that are, you know, that, and again, on, on that side, I, you know, I say to them is one of the things that if you're recruiting as a coach in America, you want someone that's uh, reliable, that's committed to what you're doing, you know, and it isn't always looking for the next thing. And I say it speaks volumes, actually, if all you're thinking about is how to get away from here and how to you know, think, focus on the now, you know, that's, uh, and we preach that a lot, you know, and that someone asked me recently, what is the most, what is the, the most difficult thing with coaching an academy or program of your size? And it is managing expectation. You know, it is, but I'm lucky that I have great staff around me and we've invested in staff to be able to help manage that, that cycle. Yeah. So hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. I totally, totally get that. The reason I ask is obviously we, we announced the Who's Fix All-Star Classic rosters and every single year we'll get messages from kids, of course, uh, that are, you know, upset about not being selected um, and, you know, in comments about this is a joke, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and some of them, yeah, when they message directly, I always try and respond. Like, I, I, well, I always do respond. Um, and I always take the route of, like, honesty is the best policy. And, and ultimately, like, just prove us wrong. Like, I'm, like, the, the people, the coaches that we speak to around the selection and everything else, it's like, ultimately, we're not, we're not necessarily right. We've had misses before in previous years. I always point to Rom, uh, Romario Spence as, as one of the most obvious examples who went on to real success with national teams that summer. We, he wasn't selected. And obviously, obviously now gone to the States. Um, and I just say, like, it's, it's on you. Like, you can either use it as motivation or you can be whiny and, and, and down about it. Uh, but yeah, having that, that self-awareness, which is key. And I do think in, in the UK, yeah, it's that, it is that island mentality of, like, people just don't have any idea of, um, of the levels. So, so yeah, the, 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 the European experience uh, with, with Myersco, can you kind of talk about, like, uh, how that first came about? Um, 
and I guess kind of talking about the journey, like the 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 logistics of it. You know, all we see is 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 the games, but of course, there's a there's a level of flying around and, and getting to these different places yeah. and everything else. So, um, yeah, can just the uh, beginning at the start, like sort of how did it come about? What made you want to do it, and and how were you able to do it? Because of course, something like that is not cheap. Yeah, I think um, first and foremost, it was a really a case of trying to get off the island, and you know, at that point when we'd when we applied for the EYBL, obviously we'd won the EABL. Um, you know, we we had good success within the EABL. The EABL really now is contested by three teams. Um, you know, and really for us it was like, well, how many how many great games are we getting with our you know top group of players? You know, I, we we you know, and this is this is not, we I guess we've manifested ourselves into a little bit of a monster in the north. You know, in a lot of ways, and that's just as it is. You know, like. That's, I don't, you know, I don't see any problem with that. I think that's, you know, testament to the work that we've done. But also, it's not, you know, it wasn't um, playing the EA Bell at that point wasn't enough for the kids that we had, and it wasn't enough for me. You know, it wasn't enough for the, the coaching staff. It wasn't enough of an experience just to stick in the country and, you know, be satisfied with winning games by, you know, X amount and going to the EA Bell finals. You know, that wasn't enough. And obviously, we were playing the national league stuff at that point, and we'd done. I, I I pushed in. So at that point, so here's here's the I'll, I'll cut right back to the, the very beginning. We tried the pro stuff. We 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 merged with the Manchester Giants. Oh, we didn't merge. We had a partnership with Manchester Giants, which facilitated guys going over there and playing. Now, unless you unless I was the head coach, I wasn't going to be able to get those guys on the floor as much as I wanted to get them on the floor. So really and truthfully, you know, yes, the experience of in practice was great, but actually, you know, the practices that we were having over there at that point were not exponentially better than the practices that the kids were having with us within the program and obviously the practices in the program are more regular um, you know we, we've supplemented with S&C they live literally a minute away from the gym so you know that then um, the, the Giants link was was great to have that experience but it affected or impacted like three or four kids which wasn't enough of a majority there wasn't enough um, input I guess from a coaching standpoint and ultimately as it does with you know with the bbl and stuff like that like it started to become you know more about oh well what can you give us financially you know and there really is like well okay it's not that's not what i'm here for so you know i'm, I'm out so we we obviously backed off from that situation um you know and we ha it hasn't been rekindled since you know that no, not once it's the irony that i have a, a conversation with um milan about Matteo Cruz, but not with our local bbl club um, you know, is uh, you know that that is that speaks volumes of the state of the game for me. But anyway, um, that's uh, you know a different story. So then we we merge with the spinners, and then I'm feeling well. I'm the head coach. You know, it's uh, I, I've got I can control the situation a little bit more. We bring in uh, you know five or six players from the academy, and then we you know we have um, you know the likes of Nick George, um, Steve Gale. Uh, obviously Mike Bernard and you know it's it, and it worked in the first year it worked you know we, we got a lot out of it um, but the but the business model wasn't sustainable you know it was uh, a castle built on sand at that point and that wasn't to discredit anything that happened before I went in because the people that have put that stuff together you know had done an unbelievable job in, in doing that but the model you know it, it was almost like I, I felt actually on reflection that it was almost like this division one, this is the last hurrah. You know, the, the old guard, I think, that put us in that situation was like, right, throw caution to the wind, let's go for it. You know, we had what, 800 people come and watch us play magic. And we had, you know, it was, it was you know, it was good. It was, uh, we, we really brought basketball into a, you know, into that, the Castle Leisure Center, which has a lot of history of in basketball. And I think the nostalgia of seeing that was satisfying enough for the people that have put us in that situation. Second year, um, you know, financially, you know, it's not working. So then it becomes like, right, well, I've got a stack of academy guys and then we're, we're able to bring in two or three, you know, and then it went from the flip opposite, three or four senior players, you know, and there was like some Jack Hudson, um, David Olf, Mark Rangeley, and, you know, still guys that have gone on to you know, really do, Connor Murta was another one, have gone on to do really good things. Um, but then what happened with that was I was putting – I was sitting in the office with with uh, at my school and I was like, God, this is stressful because the old guy had kind of stepped away. I was having to do, you know, it came a classic Jackie Moon thing, you know, where you're having to do everything. And I was like, this has gone away from coaching. This has gone away from, you know, what I was 
wanted to do. And although I've got control on the, you know, on court stuff, actually the, the amount of sacrifices that I'm making against the program that I'm paid to, to, you know, to run into coach and against my family commitments. So this mental, it's crazy. So, you know, for no money again, you know, the money had dried up. So there you go. And I decided that at that point we needed to put all the eggs in the, in the Maisco basket and just push ourselves forward. And then the year after that, you know, we had the trouble within division three cause that's where we started obviously got promoted to division two. And when we got promoted to division two, I was like, right, how do we supplement what I feel is the, the right level, which is division two for these guys that we had. And it was the European stuff. So, you know, we then uh, applied to go into Europe. Um, at that point, the, the actual application was quite stringent. So we had to send some game footage and bits and pieces like that to the organizers. I somehow managed to contact the person from the East as opposed to the person from the Central. Um, so we ended up then going into the into the east of the, the EYBL. So, you know, the likes of Zalgiris, as far away as Barsi, which is a team from um, Kazakhstan, Smoky Minsk, um, Neptunus, um, you know, obviously teams that we're now familiar with through the, the London Lions kind of journey. So that was our first um, taste of in-season in competition, but we'd done, we tested the water and, and, and played in, uh, you know, European, comp like, you know, club competitions, tournaments and stuff up to that point we've been out to some really good tournaments and i think from my standpoint it was how do we supplement the domestic stuff and challenge them internationally how do we take the guys off the island how as a coach do i become challenged and no it wasn't a case of i'm not challenged in the uk it was a case that i want a different challenge and europe was the the natural kind of transition and progression for us so i know it's a little bit of a, a long-winded story but that's how we are we arrived at kind of the european point and then and then just uh for people that are listening like what what is the format of the competition like? Because it's a lot of games, right? It's not like you're just going over there for like, you know, a couple of games. It's a lot of games. So the the, the EYBL, there's, we're in the, the Eastern Conference, um, you know, and although there's no, there's, there is a falling out between the East and the Central, but the East, I think, is historically the East is where a lot of the power programs go to. Um, Kim Key from Russia, you know, that if you look at the the winners of the East and some of the, you know, those NBA players that have come through it, for instance, you know, it's that's where a lot of the guys go to. Um, Van Spils, Riga, you know, really good established, you know, European teams. Um, so what we do is we play three um, extended weekends. And we play five games over, you know, those extended weekends. So it's uh, it's you, you play 15 games in regular season, and then you top four qualify for the playoffs or what is called the super final, and then you play everyone once within that super final. So we've obviously been to that stage, or well, we would have gone to that stage just this time as well. So typically we, we go out in September for four or five days, uh, and then we're back out in January four or five days, well actually December four or five days, in February four or five days, and then we're back out. For the the finals which is typically in april so and because it's um what's supposed to happen is that every team is supposed to host a stage um or you pay in to host so you would so you either host and don't pay or you pay and you don't host and because we're over a thousand miles from riga which is the, the 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 center of it the kind of organizing area because we're over a thousand miles away at the moment, they won't fly. We they won't fly into us. However, that's something that we did explore towards the back end of the year to be able to support that and do it. And that was something that the, they were very keen to do moving forward. So, yeah, you're looking roughly at about almost 30 days away. Um, you know, which obviously is quite significant, and it's very intense when you get out there. You know, you literally touch down, you have a a day's break, and then you're you're playing two games a day for two days, and then you no know, one game on the usually on the last day. So. And and it's they typically the the hometown team will always get us you know because of the time difference so they'll put us on at like a eight a.m. which would be seven a.m. game over here and you know especially when we started to have some success you know there was uh, always always trying to get us so yeah it's it is it's intense um, it's pure basketball the format and the the structure of the league is like I always I always describe it as being like raw. I think you know the, the, especially the teams that you're playing against. Like you're playing against Minsk, for instance. They're not bothered about filming the game. You know they bring the the guys that are playing in the Belarusian Super Division. You know they're playing in the top tier. Um, all of the all of the, their players. They've got guys that are playing up in the you know Champions League or Euro Cup, or whatever. Um, you know, and, and the one thing about it is, especially when you start to get to the final stage and the super final, is there's money on the line, so there's prize money, and How the much? teams will. 
So you go up to 5,000 in the first fight. In our first year, it was 10,000 euros to win it. This Now this last year, it's 5,000 euros to win it. 2,500 second, 1,000 euros third. So, you know, these teams, that will pay for, you know, a good stage or it will, you know, if, if you've come from Estonia, for instance, and you're in Estonia, that's a decent bit of money. What we found then was when we got to the finals that these teams had registered players initially that were that just completed Champions League games or so just completed a season in Champions League. So I had played good minutes in Champions League. Um, and yeah, that was kind of when it, it's just raw. Like that's the, the way I describe it. It's, it's really different to the ANGT in that ANGT is really about like, you know, exposure, showing it everything. You know, whereas I think with the EYBL, it's almost like, you know, guys, just come over here and, you know, sharpen your elbows and you know bring two or three crazy heckler fans and uh you know and get in there one I give an example like we we're playing Barsi the team from Kazakhstan and the owner had come with them and he'd they'd uh, bought in two players from Germany's Pro B two junior Serbian kids and the Serbian coach so this uh, one of these guys is a, a point guy who's six foot six six foot seven I remember his name but he has 52 points in this game and um they they lose well, the owner's not happy with the calls, so he's taking the team off the, he's taking them off the court. You know, we're leaving, blah blah blah. blah. And this owner's obviously invested quite a lot of money because they they want the, you know, the EYBL over in Eastern Europe has a really big reputation. So that's the kind of you know stuff that I think we've we've never had a dealt with that we've now had to see. And you know, it's, it was it was great. I mean, obviously, coaching basketball standpoint is great, but from an organisational standpoint and from a competition standpoint, it was a breath of fresh air at the right time. And obviously we had some success in our second season with it. Well, yeah, one, one, one of the buzzwords uh, we kind of hear at the moment is like loading and stuff. Like when you talk about two games a day, like how difficult is that? How do you deal with that? Are you taking out a lo- um, a bigger roster than just uh, 12? Like kind of ha- how are you managing that? And then of course, because the other thing is, right, you've still got all your, you've got your, your EYBL season, but you've still got your EABL season. You've still got your National League season. Like there's a lot of games. Yeah, and that's where the depth of the squad always comes into it. You know, we've been historically deep over the last five or six years. You know, we like that. I think a lot of if you speak to people within the EABL, typically they're saying, well, you know, you guys are really, really deep. And that's where the depth of the roster really makes a big difference. I think the other thing as well is, you know, I don't think last year we had any one player average over 22 minutes a game within the EYBL. So, you know, I go in there to rotate and, and to, you know, we it, that's where it becomes more tactical in terms of making sure that you rest players for the right moments. Um, last year, yeah, I don't think anyone, no, I'm sure no one went over 22 minutes on average, um, you know, which is critical, really important. Um, but then the depth of the roster, you've seen it with the, the London Lions, you know, in, in their European competition, obviously it's all relative in terms of what we're doing, but having that depth is important. So last year, uh, in particular, the year before we had the, you know, huge inside rotation, um, you know, we were pretty big last year, which really helped. And all those guys got a chance to contribute at the same, you know, in their own ways at different points. And I think the other thing when you go out there is, Initially in year one, um, yeah, it was you know it was definitely tough. We didn't really know how to manage that load. But as you progress and get better, and you understand the format and the structure, you only gain experience and you you improve in you know your understanding of what the competition requires. So for us, you know, the first year was always you know I'm sure you might have seen like the little videos and stuff that Alan put together was always about earning some credibility and really establishing where we are what we do and you know and how British players adapt and adjust to that level of competition year two was about going in there and trying to win it and um, you know we we learned a lot from year one that we carried into year two and you know the proof I guess was in the it's in the pudding <laughs> and that was you know winning the the regular season title um, so I, I and then I guess on a totally separate note what and this is something that they've changed this year, like the EABL, for instance, have restricted the rosters to 17 people. So for us, you know, if you're talking about loading, if you want to go and play out in European competition, then, you know, it's hypothetical at the moment because obviously with coronavirus, this isn't going to be the case. But if you're playing in European competition at the weekend and then you've got an an EABL game on the Wednesday, well, this year in theory, I would only have to be able to select through the same 17 guys. Whereas in years gone by, we'd completely flip the squad and a new team would go in there. You know, that was that number one speaks about the level of the guys that we had, you know, playing the EYBL, but also maybe the level of the EABL. Um, you know, and those teams would still go out and win in the EABL. So just depth and, uh, you know, just understanding the situation and getting experience in it, I think, is, is critical. 
I, w- I want to talk about the academy leagues, but but just just briefly, like on, on yeah, of course, you you know you won the EYBL regular season title. Like when you talk about kind of your journey and uh, kind of I guess everything you've kind of been through, like like I said, that initial email, the aspirations you had for what you wanted to do in basketball, and then of course culminating in in a in a European uh, title. Like I guess what, what did it mean for you personally um, to have that sort of success on a, on a European stage? I would. I remember standing, and everyone can take it. You know that you can take. I mean, I know that there's probably a misinterpretation as to what the EYBL is within the UK. You know, like there probably is. You know, people probably don't understand it the way that we understand it because it's not as publicised and out there in the media, I guess, as the ANGT or you know other kind of competitions, which is absolutely fine. For me, I remember back to 2015 when we were we were I was with England under 18s and we were in where were we Austria and Sweden won uh, the, the under 18s Division B on a buzzer beater against Israel and actually the irony of that is the coach of the Swedish team coaches again in the EY in the EYBL he he coaches a team over there in the EYBL which is which is good because we always chat about that but I remember turning to my friend Nick McCarthy and saying one day I really want to win a European title. So, and last year, um, you know, we, we were in the super final and we'd beaten Zalgiris for the second time, you know, and we played unbelievably, we, you know, and, and that, was, that was a great win for us. And then we were playing uh, Talin Kalev and this is the, they brought in the Champions League players and we got screwed over by the refs and actually Rayon Brown, he's probably going to be listening to this because I always bring it up, turned the ball over with seven seconds left to, to basically to to lose the the game, which cost us the super final, the playoff championship. And now that was like, you know, that was gut wrenching because I never thought I'd be in that situation again. You know, you're literally within a possession of winning a you know a European title, which was my you know aspiration. You know, and, and that's something that I really wanted to get. And then to go back in this year and to do what we did across the regular season, which is much more difficult, I think. You know, winning two two games. You know, and lucking out, I guess, in two games to actually do that was unbelievable. I, I, like I said, when I had that conversation with Nick back in 2015, I, I, I think there was the the picture of Rondo with his son and his son drinking the bottle of champagne after the uh, NBA Finals. Um, you know, Troy Cully can a credit to this. You know, I think after we won the uh, the title over there in 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 uh, Latvia, um, you know, I, it was you like a, from a coaching standpoint. You know, I felt that moment, you know, the, the moment you see Rondo sitting there, like he's achieved exactly what he, did, what he wanted to achieve in that moment. Like, you know, there's nothing taking that element away from him. I remember, uh, you know, having a beer at nine o'clock in the morning or whatever. So, you know, I just sitting there and thinking like, this is just like, you know, you, when when you're at that point when you're just like, shit, like, you know, follow my friends, like, a, you know, I, I've almost like I've done it. Like, this is, this is where I want to be. This is, you know, and I, because I didn't think I'd get the opportunity again. You know, yeah. I, I fought off the back. And how often do you win those kind of things? No matter who you're playing with or against or whatever, you still got to have some consistency to get it done. And I don't, like, it could be a, you know, I would have the same feeling if it was an A Division GB under 20s or, you know, whatever. I'd have that same feeling. That was to take, you know, a, a program from a farm in Preston, to, you know, to, to beat Champions League teams, you know, junior teams, consistently and to establish a brand of basketball in Europe that was you know that was born in England you know that was the remit from that email back in 2010 and you know we achieved it so yeah I enjoyed that beer it was very nice and uh, (laughs) you know that was uh, that was a great moment yeah so I'm aware of time, uh, and I, I do want to talk about this season as well. So there's, there's, the two topics, uh, just so let's just briefly touch on it. Just the academy leagues, obviously, you know, I was heavily involved at the start um, and kind of have, have watched the entire sort of progression, I guess. From uh, well, I was involved with the rebrand to the ABL, let's say, because it existed, but it existed before I was involved in in that way, um, and kind of kind of where it is now. Like, there's been talk about. Uh, sort of Barcelona England doing these super academies. I've kind of heard, you know, them potentially, you know, pulling out, I don't know how many, six maybe, uh, and sort of, I guess, moving to this sort of model where it's like, uh, well, I don't even know what they plan, but I'll be interested to kind of hear, like, what's your what's your take on the state of the academy leagues at the moment? Um, where they're at, what needs to be done maybe, uh, what, what direction you'd like to see them go and kind of what you've heard about this academy league stuff and, and what could be happening with it? The, sorry, so, the, super, the super academy stuff. It's a it's a great question, and I, it's, I I would 
it's an unenviable position, unenviable position for for Basketball England and the people that you know that make these decisions now. Because obviously, number one, we have this stunt in everything. You know, this this seven to eight month stunt, and potentially, you know, if that runs into this season, deep into this season, what? My question, you know, that's a rhetorical question, but what emphasis is there on performance at the moment? You know, what is the what emphasis on the performance? You know, what is happening with the national team camps? You know, how have we harnessed the rules that are in place to be able to supplement what the elite level players do? You know, what is the conversation between Basketball England and the elite performance programs historically to make sure that their players continue to play to get to to gear these guys up for European championships, whether it's this year or subsequent years? At the moment, there isn't anything happening. So we're in this big stunt. So we've gone from a position where it was mooted and talked about, about, you know, cutting the number of EABL or, you know, DICE programs, I guess, down from, you know, whatever it is at this point to, to six to eight. Um, but then, you know, the practicalities of that, I, I just don't, I just don't know. I, I think the, the, the one of the, the, the issues that you have is that, um, and this is not to discredit any program in any way, because ultimately, you know, there's things that, that are on the line that's bigger than basketball in terms of like people's livelihoods, jobs. You know, there's obviously this, the, the FE sector brings a lot of money into to basketball. You can't dispute that, um, you know, and, and it's supporting a lot of people in a lot of different ways. So but now you have this um, this kind of this uh, platform where, yeah, you've got your EABL programs and then you have your crossover programs, ABL that are good enough to be in the EABL. And then you have stacks of ABL programs that are all doing their thing, that are marketing their program in a certain way, that are recruiting from their area in a certain way. So actually your talent level is now becoming, you know, watered down. So we've got this stunt in performance, you know, we're not thinking about it. At the moment, you know, everyone is, you know, land grabbing because there's no, you know, there's no, um, no one's mediating it. So everyone's land grabbing, um, you know, and, and this is for everyone. You know, you've got programs that are recruiting national team players, you know, into the ABL, for instance, you know, off their own merit. For, but, you know, is that what BE envisaged this to, to look like? So how are we going to go back on this situation in a year or so's time where when 18 months worth of work has been done? And what are we going to do from that point? And I'm talking about 18 months of work from the programs, the islands within the island where people are just like in their silo you know, doing what they can do, and rightly so, because, you know, that's where, you know, you want to encourage ambition and stuff like that. Like, that's what's happening. But how do we go back and recover from that position and make it more of a performance pathway? Ultimately, you know, if you ask me, less is probably more. Uh, you know, pooling the resources in certain areas is definitely, you know, something that should be looked at. But then the other thing is as well is what happens to the coaches within the ABL that have committed their time, like I did back in the day, um, you know, that deserve an opportunity that should be working with the higher level players, you know, what happens to them? So, you know, I, I think really it's a it's a question that, you know, is a huge question. I just think at the moment it's out of control, um, you know, and I, and I don't know when, you, when it's going to be able to pull it back in. And I understand that from a number of reasons. You know, I understand that, you know, the COVID situation, for instance, and, and BE, and, you know, there's, there probably isn't the resource to manage the performance pathway at the level that it needs to be managed. Um, you know, I understand that we just need to get people back playing. But on the flip side, working within performance, you know, and having a number of kids that are on the performance level, you know, we we, we don't hear anything. I like there's no one there's no one mitigating against their development. There's no one saying like, you know, how do we make sure and ensure these guys are continue to progress forward? And we're lucky that we got into the the El Lynch Trophy and we we're able to give these guys, you know, some games. Yeah. Um, I just think, so, I think just quickly for the for the sake of the listener, it's worth just mentioning that obviously yeah, your national league, you're in national league division two, which under yeah. the current guidance is not allowed to play basketball, so there is no, essentially there is no season as it as it currently stands um, until that changes. And of course, you know, in your situation, which you're the only, are you you're the only academy in uh, or, or sort of elite academy like that that's lower, right? Sure. Charmwood as well in Division Two. Ah, uh, and Charmwood, of course, yeah, yeah, right. So, so you know, you're in a situation where you know both of you guys have got elite players that are potential future pros, that are potential future GB seniors. That, as it stands, though they will be able to play academy leagues, but obviously yeah. it's a different thing. We'll have no national league season. Um, so it's a it's a tough. Just we'll we'll get back onto COVID briefly, but but let's just say let's just say there was no co- no COVID and we were in a we we're in a regular season. 
Yeah. Um, and, and you were head of performance for, for GB Basketball, for Basketball England, or whatever, overseeing the performance pathway, looking at the academy leagues and stuff. What would you personally do? What would you be looking to implement as a priority to uh, help nurture, grow, uh, the, the, help the development of, of young British basketball players? I'm, I'm, this is, uh, you know, this might be the job interview question or whatever, but um, I think that there's ways and means to expose our players to a higher level of basketball from an earlier age. And I think actually, if you go back on where the EABL was, you know, when we when this went through the the flip and it was, you know, there was what there was less programs. The the talent was finding its way into the EABL. It was, you know, even through the likes of like you know, Preston College and, and Milton Keynes. And, you know, it's so looking back at that, you know, Moulton back then as well, you know, that these, the, the, there wasn't an, an influx and flood of programs and talent was finding its way into the league that you wanted it to be in. So actually that age group was was pretty much taken care of. If you look back at like, you know, the his, historically, ha, has it has it been uh, productive? Well, yeah, because you've got an A division, division A division 18s, A division 20s, and the majority of those players have, far, have been part of the EABL, have come through the EABL, you know, system. So that's great, okay. But what we find is, I think, actually, the 16s, you know, why have we not been able to have any sustained success with 16s, 15s, 14s, and down? It's because we're not exposing the players to a high enough level at a young enough age. And I think that the actual academy structure that we had, going back to 20. 13 through to maybe 17 i think was you know really kind of on point when the abl wasn't as prevalent and you had guys filtering into the eabl and you were able to pull your talent and coach your talent in a certain way that was great the the the, the thing has changed now so i actually think right now we need to leave that tier and just put it to one side you know the, that tier because at the moment there's too much to to do i think that you can impact the lower tiers a lot quicker and a lot you know a lot sooner and i've i've said this to a couple of people for instance the experience that we you know what are we judging our our um performance on well our performance is ultimately going to be the results and progression potentially at european championships you know at junior age groups so that's something that we're judging our development on you know i guess that's kind of a a good teller so with the 16s for instance or the younger age groups you know our performance and our results haven't been, you know, great and haven't been in an akin with where the 18s and 20s are. How do we improve that? Well, if we're exposing our 16s and younger age groups to their first part of international t- basketball, you know, maybe we do a one tournament Copenhagen and then we have a prep game and then we're into the European Championships. It's not enough. Like it isn't enough. So, for instance, the outlay that we've put on the EYBL, you know, that has greatly helped our guys prep you know national team players prep for national team you know camps and get some experience it's greatly helped their resilience as they move on to the next level it's greatly helped their understanding of the game from a different perspective can we not do the same thing with the younger age groups so for instance you know if it was 16s 15s if you actually look at the east eybl and the eybl will be you know they would take teams indefinitely You've got the Zalgiris, Seska Moscos, you've got national teams, you've got, you know, extremely high level programs. Well, we could put our national, we could ask our national team guys to meet at an airport, supplemented, you know, obviously funded by the, the NGB, supplemented by possibly by the players if it's a cost, you know, if it's a cost problem, fly them out to the EYBL in Estonia, give them that long weekend, three day, three times over the, the course of the year, prep them better going into European championships. I think that would that would uh, harvest you know better results, and you know straight away we're starting you know building better perspective for these kids, better experience. The culture of that group would change for sure because they you know see basketball from a different perspective, and hopefully that starts to teeter back into these guys you know funneling into programs that will enable them to develop at the next level versus enable them to develop you know in terms of uh, their you know their ego. Um, mm-hmm. So. I think that just refining the the younger age groups, I think, would be you know really important. But that's just you know one thing, and I think that would be very simple to do. Yeah, yeah, I, I do feel like there's some easy wins, isn't it? Yeah, I mean the frustration with the EABL, obviously, like clearly, you know, I remember having conversations back back then where it was like, you know, what, what's the intention here? Well, the intention is, you know, it was ace before it was dice. So so these ace programs have the best provision for for the top young players. They they they're forced to have X amount of strength and conditioning, you know, physio, education, whatever uh, hours on the court, etc. 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 So so for a, for a young top player, that's where they should be if they're going to de- 
keep developing. And so it was like, well, that, that's 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 the whole idea. Then it's like make the competition so that we funnel everyone into the, into into it, uh, and all the top young young players want to play in it. It's not a case of we're saying this is where you have to go. It's like well, actually, you create the brand around it, and it just attracts them to it to it anyway, right? Which is essentially what happened. Then, of course, the ABL, and this is where it gets tough, right? Is it was like there was a whole conversation where it's like you know there are these schools that are putting in resource. That, that should be should, should have something you know like they should be rewarded for being willing to put in resource into basketball and I totally get that but now looking into what it's become and obviously the ABL has been massively diluted and I don't even obviously I'm not in those conversations anymore so I don't know what the aim is I don't know what the conversations are around it um, but that the ABL has created a level of like I mean I, I, I definitely know that uh, uh, there's a lot of ABL schools that think that they should be in the ABL, that think they're on that level and will market themselves as such. Of course, there are other teams that can compete on the floor, like like obviously a Haringey. Um, and so it's, the the lines have become blurred, and it's not so clearly delineated anymore. And it it's just become a bit of a mess. And I I do think there needs to be a a lot of stuff um, done about it. Anyway, I digress quickly. So so COVID. Um, you know, you're in a tough, situ- tough, tough situation this season. Uh, like, like you were just saying there, you managed to get into the Lynch Trophy, uh, which they, you know, you and uh, and Charm were the non-division one sides that were kind of allowed allowed to play. Of course, we're now two weeks into the into the Lynch Trophy, so two weeks into the season, we've had seven games cancelled because of, um, you know, basically players having to self-isolate because they've either been around a positive test or, or whatever it might be. You know, wh- do you see the season being able to play out? Like, do you see uh, you guys having a season? How do you see this sort of impacting uh, British basketball? I mean, well, I've, I, I I do see us having a season. Yeah, like, you know, it's it started at this point and obviously the Junior National League is going to be kicking off soon as well. But the problem is, it's like this ultimate paranoia of, you know, is a, is a block nose COVID, is, a, you know, is a is a headache COVID is, you know, and then it's from a from a management standpoint, that's really, really difficult. You know, it's really difficult to mitigate against all of that, you know. Um, so... I think that it's going to be hugely disrupted. I think that there's probably going to be some changes over the next, uh, you know, maybe four weeks. Um, I don't, what, what I, I mean, what is number one, what is the rush? You know, what, it, what is the rush when, you know, at this point we know that we're coming into the winter season, the, the weather's changing, you know, people are going to get ill. And at the moment we have this huge boom in, you know, cases. So inevitably there's going to be, you know, there's going to be disruption to the basketball schedule. If we were to push back to February, for instance, you know, on league and run the leagues February through to June, you know, is that too much of a of an issue? Like, what is the rush at the back end of the season, considering what's happened? You know, like, I think at this point, there is maybe a, an eagerness to get back onto the court, but I don't think there needs to be a, be a rush. The fortunate thing that we have is within our program is we have, 15, 20 really competitive players, you know, in each of our groups and, you know, they really get after each other and they're getting, a, you know, a good experience from basketball in terms of their practices. So actually we're, we're doing what we can with what we have. But I think if you look at the, the season running on, I, I think, and having, you know, having to deal with, you know, a number of, you know, obviously we're working with an education environment as well. And I think, what was it yesterday? 46% of education environments so far have had, you know, sent people home, whether it's one or in groups, you know, that's in the nationally. So let's be real. You know, there's, I don't think there should be a rush. I think that we should be thinking about, you know, obviously a little bit more of a pushback, um, you know, letting the situation at the moment, you know, this, whether it's political football or whether it's, you know, obviously mitigating against, you know, this bu- big bump in uh, numbers. I think that there needs to be some... Uh, we need to really think about that in terms of how it impacts us because ultimately if we rush into it and there's either outbreaks or there's fixtures being cancelled like you said before that you know the seven fixture fixture cancellations that we've had through the L Lynch trophy so far people just then start asking the wrong question and don't have they 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 almost discredit basketball but actually that's people taking the right precaution but people need to get used to that really quickly if we're going to go with what we're doing now if if you like what is the if we're not for instance, I would be worried if there wasn't a fixture cancellation. You know, well, what? what's, you know... I would People are forcing worried. their guys on the court and, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, what, what What do we want? You can't have your cake and eat it, you know. That's uh, that's the big thing. So, we either want to play basketball and get back into it, then we're going to have to accept that there's going to be cancellations. Or if we don't want that, if we want to have more of a free-flowing season where fixtures are happening more rapidly and, you know, on a regular basis, then push it back. Yeah. But, you know, at the moment... Um, 
I'm just fortunate that we can get on the court, that we've, you know, really not had any major issues, um, you know, and, and that we're kind of flowing. I guess that's one of the benefits of being on a, a campus locked away and, you know, miles away and stuff. But it's just so difficult. And I've spoken to a lot of coaches and people just, I always kind of like quantify it like we're the uh, we're we're an airplane just floating around ready to hit on the to, to land and at the moment we're just free we're just floating around like that is it it's in limbo um you know and, and there's a lot of work to be done there from a mental health perspective and you know that stuff and then the other thing from a working with this age group is it's disproportionate in terms of how that affects them you know like we don't know the long-term effects yada 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 but they don't see it like that. These these guys, these kids, they just want to get on the court and play. And you know, there's no. Uh, I, I think I read something about the US and seventy thousand college cases, and there was one hospital admission. You know, obviously there's a huge knock on effect to elderly. You know, more elderly and more susceptible people, which we need to be sensible about. But you know, young players, they're, they're blasé. You know, and that's something that we have to. You know, we we've shortened our bubbles down to. You know, there's no more than twelve in our bubbles now. Um, you know it really affects them in terms of being able to mingle and cross over and obviously the delivery of online classes and stuff like that it's just it's just it's very uh it's we have to make the inconvenient convenient but also people need to expect it to be disrupted if we're going to push back and start and so if we're gonna if we're gonna kick on now you know that's has to be how that has to people have to expect that yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. Like, I still sometimes like I can't actually believe this is reality. Like this is actual <laughs> life. Anyway, I want to be respectful of your time. It's nine thirty on the dot. Uh, Neil, thank you so much. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, I definitely think we do need to do a part to it because there's a whole bunch of stuff we didn't even touch upon that I would love to go into at some point. Um, but yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, obviously all the best for this season. Hopefully, uh, we have a season. It, it goes through, and kind of you can get your guys playing games, and uh, yeah, everyone's happy. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it.